We have lifted up our joys and our concerns, and we have gone through the traditions of our ancestors in the faith. In short, Lord, we have prepared ourselves for your word. And we now ask that your word would, would descend upon us from on high, would touch our hearts and change our lives. Whether your word are the exact words that come from my mouth or not, may your word and your word alone be the ones that reach our ears and our hearts. Gracious Lord, it is for this we pray. Amen. We are now in our fourth week at the look on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And I will continue to make this joke. As a pastor, I felt that if I was going to steal a sermon from anywhere, why not steal it from God? And so we are looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We have talked about how blessed are the poor in spirit. We have talked about how blessed are those who mourn. And we have talked about blessed are the gentle, or the meek, or the humble, whichever word you want to put there. And we had to admit and, and wrestle with these, these sayings, because admittedly, in our own experience, they're probably not what we expect. We don't expect people who are poor in spirit, whether that's Poor in spirit as in poor, or whether that's poor in spirit as in not stubborn, to be considered blessed. We don't think of the gentle, the meek, the, the humble, those who are often trampled on as being blessed. We don't think of the people in mourning as being blessed. And, and let me say that finally, finally today Jesus said something that is a little bit easier to understand. It's not quite so confusing. Finally today, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now this isn't so confusing because this is what we've known God to say all along, right? This has been a part of the Psalms, a part of the law. This is, this is exactly what we are expecting Jesus to say, that, that if we are righteous, then God is going to take care of us because that has been the promise. And so finally, we, we have one that's not quite so confusing. Now, you know, it, it's not exactly an apparent truth when we look around the world. Because when we look around the world, so often we see the unrighteous as being the ones that prosper, right? Right? I mean, think about it. We think about the, the super rich. They're not prospering because they're overly generous, right? They're prospering because they have a little bit of problem with greed and they keep wanting more. And there's never enough. Right? Or we think about the, the celebrities. And they're prospering, but, but they show us examples of great vanity and and self-centeredness. We think about our, our famous politicians. Name one that hasn't lied. You know, these, these people that, that we see prospering and doing well, the people who, who we, we look up to for our statuses of success are not necessarily people that we would say are the most righteous. I mean, heck, drug dealers make billions of dollars a year annually at the top levels. And Lord knows they're not practicing righteousness. And yet here we have the stake. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. We know this to be true, we know that this is a God thing, a God promise. It's consistent with everything else that we have heard from, from the Father all through the past before Jesus. But the world still doesn't seem to work that way. And, and I, I think 
that Jesus chose his words carefully. I think he chose his words carefully because he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not blessed are those who seek righteousness. Blessed are those who seek to be righteous. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when we think about the word hunger and thirst, that means that there's a longing, that something is missing, right? That, that when we're hungry, we need food and we don't have it readily available. Otherwise, we wouldn't be hungry. Or when we're thirsty and parched, it's, it's because there's not something immediately available to quench that thirst within us. And so I think Jesus is actually acknowledging the fact that the world does not reflect this value, but that the people he is calling and talking to, the people who are going to receive God's promise, they, they're going to be hungry and thirsty for this. They're going to, they're going to experience this desire for it that may not be easily fulfilled when they look around. And that's where his promise comes in. That have hope, have faith, because God will satisfy that desire in you. You will have the, the righteousness to quench that thirst. You'll have the goodness to fill that, that desire, that hunger. It's a promise that God is going to be triumphant. And we all know that we can count on God's promises, right? He's the, he's the God who, who never has backed down on a promise. And, and we know that we can count on His promises because of Easter. Everything points back to Easter, by the way. If you haven't figured that out in this faith. Everything is about Easter in one way or another. Because it's all about the new life, right? And, and in this particular promise, we can count on it because of Easter. Because how many other people do you know that have predicted how they're going to die, actually died, predicted their resurrection, and then actually resurrected themselves? Only one. Jesus Christ. Only Jesus, only God has done that. And let me tell you, I think it's a far harder task to resurrect from the dead than it is to win victorious over the world. Lots of people can win and beat the world. Only Jesus has been able to prove resurrection and life. And so this is a promise that we can count on. There's, there's a reason for this hope that we have in Jesus. And I think this is something that he felt he needed to say to the crowds that were gathered there on the mountain because as they looked around, they probably were, were kind of thinking, you know, the unrighteous are kind of winning. I mean, the Romans really have all the power, and, and the Pharisees, they're self-righteous, but they really look down on everyone else. And, you know, they, they, really kind of, they really kind of tear people down. They make going to temple not, not so much a time of worship and praise of God, but instead it's like a chore. And they have all these rules and regulations that, can, that make it impossible to even live and feel like you can get close to God. I mean, if the Jewish people sitting at Jesus' feet were looking around, they probably needed a little bit of encouragement or a reminder that God will be victorious in the end, and those who follow Him are going to be a part of that victory. But you see, what they probably didn't connect is there's a bigger connection between all of these phrases. Usually when we read the quote-unquote Beatitudes, the Matthew 5 verses 3 through oh, about 11 or 12, you know, the blessed bees that we've been in, we like to think of blessed be the poor in spirit. They're this group of people over here. Blessed are those who mourn, and they're kind of this people here. And blessed are the gentle, and they're this, this other group of people here. And blessed are those who hunger and seek for righteousness, for hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? There are all these different people when we, we, we start thinking about this often. That's how we look at this. But you know what? There's a bigger connection that if you really look at these things, all of them together, 
are all descriptors of the children of God. That they're not a different group of people. Instead, they are all one group of people. Because if we are the children of God, there are going to be times in our lives where we are going to be poor, even if it's only in spirit, because we will have given so much to others. There's times that we're going to be poor in spirit because we will have to let go of our own stubbornness, our own will to be in charge, and we will have to submit to our Lord as master. There are going to be times where we will mourn because, let me tell you, no one gets out of this life alive. And we will mourn and lose people. And we will have to, to say temporarily goodbye to them as as God calls them to rest until that time when we get to be in their presence again. We are a people that are called to be gentle, meek, and humble, to have that quiet strength to not harm others, ever, in pursuit of our own gains, or even God's gains. That there is no reason to harm. And we are meant to be a people that does and lives for good. All of these things are connected. They're all about the same group of people. And if we're not feeling that, that hunger and that thirst, that desire for righteousness that is all the way into our core and that permeates every fiber of our being, you know, that, that quest not for the legalistic rules, but, but for goodness, for doing good in the world, then can we really say that we are living in the image of Christ fully? I mean, Christ was all about doing good. All the good that was possible. Even when it cost him and it was, it was a sacrifice on his behalf his part. And so we need, to, we need to feel that desire, that, that, that passion for God's goodness that is, that is built out of love in the totality of our beings. And it is when we get to that point in our lives and in our walks of faith that that we truly can begin to say that we're, that we're the children of God. Because when we truly seek to do all of the good that is possible, we will learn to be humble. We will be meek because we can, will not do harm. We will be poor in spirit because we will be submissive. And we will give it hurts. We will be peacemakers because we will abhor the thought of war and fighting. We will be the people that God has called us to be. And so it is my hope and my prayer for you and for me that, that the desire for goodness and righteousness would fill you entirely. That there would not be a part of you that ever does not want to do all of the good that you can. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When we get to that place where we are the children of God, we will inherit the kingdom of heaven. We will inherit the earth. We will be comforted. We will be made in the image of Christ. And we will be the people of God. Let us be that people today. Let us be that people tomorrow. And each day from now until eternity. Amen.